Hello and welcome back to Build a CubeSat. I'm Manuel and today we are starting our read-through of the CubeSat standard and filter out what's most relevant right now to get this project started. This video is for you if you are kind of new to the whole CubeSat thing or you don't usually read a lot of technical documentation. In case you just want to find out what I think are the most important parts of this document, I also put a few bullet points in the description. Also, I'm going to split this into two videos because there's kind of a lot to go over. So, the CubeSat standard is published and maintained by Cal Poly over at CubeSat.org. So, this is where you would have to download this document. Of course, I've also put a link in the description. And you would go to Resources and CubeSat Information. Scroll down a little and that's the one we want to get. So the current version is 14.1 and they put out a new revision every few years, I would say. Once you got this open, um, it kind of looks like this. I have inverted the colors here so it's a bit easier on the eyes. The way I read a document like this is to first filter out all the parts that are most relevant for me right now and make sure I really understand those. So this involves having a separate list where I would um, shut down things that I need to investigate or look up or uh, copy paste over um, the most important bits and also where it makes sense scribbling into the PDF if I you know, need to draw something in. So if we start by looking at the table of contents we already get a good idea about what's going to be important for us today which is the CubeSat specifications mainly. Um, in this video, I would like to go over the general specifications and the mechanical specifications and do the electrical and operational in uh, the next video. Testing is, of course, a huge topic when it comes to any satellite or any spacecraft. Um, the thing is, I myself need to learn a bit more about it before I can kind of make a video about it, so we are going to skip this for the moment. Also, the CubeSat dispenser doesn't really concern us right now, so yeah, we're also going to skip this. If you scroll down, you get a list of acronyms and abbreviations. Of course you do, because it's an aerospace project and you need a lot of acronyms. Um, you don't really need to memorize all of these, because you will um, come across the most important ones all the time. But it's good to have to look stuff up. Then below this we get a list of other applicable documents, which is really interesting. These are other um, you know, standards and manuals um, that are relevant to this document. And I'm sure we are going to look at some of those in the future. So after this we get the overview, which, uh, is, interest, which is an interesting read. And then we, get, we start to get into the meat of the whole thing. So at the top of this page, you get an overview of some of the CubeSat sizes. And the one I would like to develop is the 2U, this one right here. Now there are kind of two purposes of the CubeSat design specifications. The first one is, and the most important one, is to make sure that CubeSats are designed in a way that they are safe and don't wreak havoc uh, on other payloads or the launch vehicle. So that's the most important bit. The second one is uh, to ensure compatibility with all the different dispenser systems because um, different launch service providers have different dispensers and if we all follow this design specifications um, we can be sure that um, they are compatible together. Which of course is a win for the whole CubeSat community because um, it makes it easier for people to, to develop CubeSats and for launch providers to accept them as secondary payloads. One thing to note here is that launch providers will have their own set of specifications which take precedence over this document actually. But if we design according to this document, we are already kind of safe that it will, it will be compliant with other requirements. Of course, once you know which launch provider you will be using, you will need to get their documentation and, and, and check your design against, against that document. So now I think we can scroll down a little to the general specifications for CubeSats. The 
Finally, the first dimension is that all parts shall remain attached to the CubeSat during launch ejection and operations. So this basically means um, your CubeSat can not deploy any other things or leave behind any, any debris. Sure, important to know. Then the second one is about paratechnics, um, which I will try to not have on board because I kind of don't like to have the idea of having something that generates a lot of heat, even if it's controlled. So I'll try to um, navigate my way around using pyrotechnics. Also, um, the thing about propulsion systems is not that relevant um, to us right now because I don't plan on doing any propulsion, as I have said in an earlier video, I think. Then there is a note about um, battery sizes and uh, FA regulations for batteries uh, above 100 watt hours, which is not going to concern us because that's kind of a lot. On the other hand, this note about um, outgassing is very much concerning us. Um, so in, in space where there is no atmosphere and you have a lot of extreme temperatures, you know, extreme heat when the CubeSat is exposed to, to the sun uh, versus extreme cold when it's in the, in the Earth's shadow, some materials tend to kind of lose or release all, all their volatiles, especially plastics, of course. So choosing which plastic to use on your, on your CubeSat if you use any at all, which, you know, we probably have to at some, for some parts, is kind of, in, is kind of um, um, critical. It's kind of critical because um, the volatiles that get out of the, of the plastics are going to deposit or of, on some other surface. And these surfaces may be parts of your cube set, like lenses, which you would not want to be covered with anything, or even other cube sets in the same dispenser, which you also would not want to impact. So yeah, that's kind of an important thing to keep in mind. Then there's a note about passive magnets that should be limited to 0.5 Gauss and a bit about ascent venting. Um, these are two things that I would put on the needs more investigation list because I don't fully understand them right now. So slowly but surely it gets a bit more interesting as we're heading into the CubeSat mechanical specifications. And right off the bat, it tells us that we should look at the CubeSat specification drawings in Appendix B which we are going to do right now. So let's head to page 27, I think, yeah. So what you get here is basically a bunch of mechanical drawings for um, various sizes of CubeSets. We are going to skip to the 2U CubeSet. And I'm also going to turn on the colors for a moment here, like this, yeah. All right, there's kind of uh, a few things that I would like to point out. First and foremost, um, we see here that the sides of the cube sets are conveniently labeled with uh, plus and minus X, Y, and C, with C being the long edge of the cube set. So next thing to note is that all dimensions are in millimeters and the tolerance is plus minus 0 0.1 millimeter which is kind of forgiving. Um, one other thing is that the, the origin point of the coordinate system is in the, cent in the geometric center of the CubeSat. And protrusions are only allowed on the yellow faces. So what does that mean? This means that, um, well, the rails, the gray parts here have to be really exactly specified and designed and manufactured because these are the parts that are going to interface with the rails in the deployer. So these need to fit really precisely and we don't really have any design freedom on those. They just need to be smooth, continuous surfaces. But the yellow parts are the sides and here we have some more design freedom because they are not going to touch any other part of, um, of the dispenser or any other cube set. 
So the overall dimensions, um, as we have mentioned previously, can I draw in here? Yeah, is 100 by 100 by 227 millimeters. I'm sorry about the terrible drawings. Uh, my graphics tablet actually doesn't work with Ubuntu yet, so I'm limited to using the touchpad. So these are the overall dimensions. The most, I would say, I would argue the most um, critical or one of the most critical dimensions here is the size of the rails. They need to be 8.5 millimeters, at least 8.5 millimeters on each side. As we can see here, there is a chamfer on each edge of the rail and a little fillet. Maybe I can zoom in a little more here. Yeah, these um, edges are chamfered and here there is a little fillet. So considering this, we need to make sure that uh, the surface that remains is a 6.5 millimeter square. That's because this is where um, the, our rails may touch the rail ends of other cube sets or the dispenser itself. And the way the dispenser works is that it has like a large spring at the end with a plate and you kind of insert the cube sets from the front, lock the dispenser and when it's time to deploy the, the door unlocks and the cube, set get, the cube sets get pushed out um, by the spring force. And so we kind of need to make sure that there's uh, enough contact area to distribute this force evenly so nothing jams up in the dispenser. So about these protrusions that were mentioned before, that they're basically anything that sticks out from one of the yellow sides here. Um, these, they, they may stick out beyond the surface, beyond the plane of the, of the rails, but they need to keep some distance to the rails. Um, we will talk about that a little bit later because that's kind of important. We need to make sure that they touch nothing in the, nothing else in the dispenser. Oh, one thing we haven't mentioned yet is that uh, the rails, of course, um, stick out on the, on the C faces, on the C ends of the cube set. So that's a minimum of um, 0 0.1 millimeter up to seven millimeter of stick out of the rail ends. So I think that's everything we need to point out here for the moment. If you scroll down a little, you get to see these cylindrical things. These are called tuna cans. They are basically um, cylindrical volumes that are that may or may not be available um, depending on which dispenser you use. Um, I think they're only available, uh, available on 3U and larger cube sets, so that is nothing we need to concern ourselves with. And I think now we can skip back to page 10 where we left off before. So the next thing mentioned here is the cube set inspection and fit check procedure CIFP, which is a document we are going to refer to in a minute. Then these are things we have already discussed. The stand of length um, is the you know the stick out of the of the rails at the C ends that needs to have a certain length to um, prevent interference. The tuna cans we have looked at, this is, that's more details about the tuna cans. One interesting thing to note is that the C minus face will be inserted into the dispenser first. So I would like to compare this in the future with, um, with uh, launch providers documents and see if this is really how it's done. So. Just a thing to note, a thing to put on the, on the list to, to look into a bit more. Now uh, there's a bit about the protrusions that no component shall protrude farther than 6.5 millimeter normal to the surface from the plane of the rail. So in order to make this a bit more understandable, I would like to head over to cubesat.org again and look at this CIFP the interference and fit check procedure document. 
And basically what you get here is a ready-made checklist for you to fill out when you're at the stage where you can fit check your CubeSat. So there is of course a lot of very interesting stuff, but I would like to skip to page 9, I think, for the moment. Oh, there's some standoff being measured, which you have mentioned before. There we go. So, um, amazingly, the planes can protrude beyond the, the plane, so the sides can protrude beyond the plane of the rails. And here um, they are making sure that the that these, the PCB that this person is, is measuring right here has a certain distance from the edge of the rail, which I think needs to be 8.5 millimeters at least, because otherwise it would cover up part of the rail, which would not make that much sense. So, and the other thing, that's a good picture of, of what I wanted to show. Um, the protrusions in this case are not allowed to be more than um, 6.5 millimeters. So if you have like, like here, if you have a bolt on a PCB, that's kind of tricky to measure. So what is being recommended here is that you first measure the distance from the rail to the PCB. And then from the, from the bolt, from the end, from the head of the bolt to the PCB, and you just add these to get the total um, protrusion. So that is what what this um, part here means that um, no part, no component should protrude farther than 6.5 millimeter from the plane of the rail. It's kind of, you know, the wording is a bit opaque, but that's all there is, I think. So of course, deployables shall be constrained by the cube set and not the dispenser, so yeah. They need to be held to your cube set and also in their stoke position not protrude any farther than 6.5 millimeters. Um, kind of makes sense. There is this 8.5 millimeter figure again for the rails, specifically for where the side is allowed to, to start, the side panel is allowed to start. Yeah, that's, that was a bunch of dimensions. Now we get into something interesting that the rail should have a surface roughness of less than 1.6 micrometers. That is um, also here note it's that normally this is uh, already considered done if, if you uh, properly anodize the aluminum you're using. But the surface roughness, roughness itself is something I don't completely understand yet, so that would go on the list of things I would like to investigate further. And here we have this fillet we saw on um, page 27 uh, of at least one millimeter. So if we uh, skip back, it was page 29 to page 30 actually. If we zoom into this little, uh, this fillet here, so this rounding here, needs to have a radius of at least one millimeter. That's, I think that's all it said there. So if we go back now. So here we have this note again about the uh, C minus and plus faces that should have at least 6.5 millimeters squared of a contact area. Now with the added note that 25% of this surface can be recessed. In order to understand what this means, um, I may need to give some context. So from the moment a CubeSat is integrated to the moment it is deployed, um, it needs to be fully inert. So the connection from the batteries to the rest of the system needs to be fully cut. Um, the way this is done is by employing small switches, actual mechanical switches um, that, would, that would sense if the CubeSat is still in the deployer, so the switch would be pressed down, or if it's been, if it's been uh, released, the switch would be released too. 
and it, it would be allowed to power up. These switches are located in the C plus uh, end, I think, and they poke out through little holes in the 6.5 millimeter um, squared area. So that's all this means. Um, I think 25% of 6.5 millimeters squared will result in a diameter of about three millimeters. So our switch plunger may be um, three millimeters in diameter or less. Um, yeah, that's all this says. Also at a later point, I think we'll um, see that this document mentions uh, employing uh, sp uh, small spring-loaded plungers that would um, promote the separation of the of the cube sets, but we'll get to this part in a bit, I think. So next we get a table of maximum mass for different cube set sizes. Um, here there are four kilograms mentioned for a 2U cube set. I have seen um, other launch provider documents that mention less, like 3.6 kilograms. Um, yeah, that's just something to, to, to have in mind that this may be, you know, a different spec from what the launch provider in the end will, will want. The next interesting thing is the bit about center of gravity location. So the center of gravity is basically just the point where your cube set is balanced around all three axes. Uh, yeah, it's pretty, you know, intuitively understandable, I think. And for a 2U cube set, this may be um, plus minus 2 centimeters on the x and y axes and plus minus 4.5 centimeters on the z-axis. Why is this important? Um, I think it's a big concern in anything that is launched into space to kind of know where its center of gravity will be to avoid it imparting... Um, you know, strong vibrations on launch. And also, I think if the center of gravity was, was really far off in one edge, in one, in one corner of the volume, uh, you would kind of get a lot of, uh, you know, rotational, mom rotational momentum once the cube set is pushed out of the dispenser. But, you know, just touching from here, I think plus minus two centimeters and respectively plus minus 4.5 centimeters is a very achievable goal. So next we get a note about which materials are recommended to use, which is really handy. Aluminum 7075 and 6061 are mentioned here, which are both really, you know, widely available alloys. Uh, I think 6061 is really, you know, the go-to material for a lot of things. And I think for the moment that's, that would be my material of choice. Also cost-wise, I think it's a bit cheaper than 7075. Um, Material-wise, I think the main difference is that 7075 has a bit of a better mass to weight, uh, sorry, strength to weight ratio, while 6061 is a bit more corrosion resistant. So yeah, if there's not a huge difference, I would go with the cheaper option which seems to be 6061. And of course, again, there is note that all external surfaces made of aluminum should be hard anodized. I mean, that is something that you would do anyways if you use uh, aluminum. Now, here we have another mention of these spring-loaded plungers that can be used to encourage separation from neighboring cube sets. Uh, I think the problem is that you have if you push out multiple cube sets out of the dispenser in one go, they tend to kind of come together. But it have, if you have a small force pushing between them, they tend to separate more easily. I think that's all there is to it. So we also get a note about um, which spring force is desired. And of course, um, a stipulation that this plunger sh should not uh, extend beyond the level of the standoff when it's when it's compressed, when it's stowed. Also, uh, they mentioned that the most common placement of the separation mechanism is on the C- minus face, face as per figure 5, but actually figure 5 calls out the C plus face. Um, I think C- is correct though. 
So I think this is a good point to break for today because this video is probably getting long by now. Um, in the next chapter we are going to talk about the electrical specifications and we are specifically going to talk more about deployment switches and other safety related features of course. Yeah, I hope this has been useful for you so far. Um, let me know if you like this episode. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.